Welcome and thanks for coming. Who else is wearing their special colorful vendor socks? Anyone else? I wear them at every talk. I can, you know, be a little flamboyant, but only upon call. Anyway, I'm Richard Greenberg, and I am a former CISO of 15 years, and um, we have these problems where I work, too. Um, I am a global OWASP board member, but that had nothing to do with my talk being selected. It's a blind process. I just want to clear the air on that. I was rejected in D.C. There's proof. And so here I am. Hopefully I can shed some light on what the life of a CISO is like and what people at that level are doing, right, to address what's going on in the environment today. Um, hopefully there'll be some takeaways for everyone, regardless of the level of your work and where you work. Uh, clearly most people here are hands-on and in development and security of, uh, of code. Uh, that I'll be talking about some of that. Thankfully, I don't have to explain the difference between static and dynamic scanning, not to this group, which is what I normally have to do. Um, but uh, there will be other things. If you have a question, please raise your hand. I don't mind in the middle. Uh, discussion is always welcome. And let's get going. Let's see what we can come up with. Yes, it's working. Excellent. So um, the good news is that in boardrooms, finally, at the C-suite, security is now being discussed, right? For the wrong reasons, but we'll take it, just because there's tons of breaches. Now, it's, uh, you know, on the cover of magazines and newspapers, um, I'm not sure how your experience is, but mine certainly, the last four or five years, friends and relatives are now saying to me, hey, what's going on with security? You know, now they're concerned, where in the past they had no clue, nor did they care. You'll still have people like that, of course, but, you know, that's the good news. Um, in, again, I'm based in America. I'll be saying a few things if it's not applicable here. I'd be curious to know that. So just, you know, yell out if you see something and you want to educate me, right? Because I'm still learning about EU and other areas. Um, but in America, they're trying to legislate security a little bit. But every time they try to legislate security, it's a miserable failure because they're legislating on things that for two years ago. So they're always behind. However, the good news about legislation in the states, we can use that for budgetary purposes, right? Compliance. Compliance is not security. We all know that. But from the perspective of getting budget, it's wonderful. I, I was working in the health department in L.A. County, L.A. is a little town on the west coast of the states. And uh, once HIPAA came, my peers were all freaking out. Oh, oh, my God. And I said, are you kidding? This is the best thing that's ever happened to us. And all of a sudden, we got funding. So um, good news. So here's the deal. Our data is leaking. We all know that, right? It's, it's a terrible situation now. Breaches are, are increasing in all, all ways, every application uh, that we're writing, phishing attacks are getting people left and right. We can try to educate our users as much as possible, but ultimately we're not going to stop at all, right? Um, and, the, and the sad fact is that breaches are happening and people aren't even knowing about it. The perpetrators are in our systems for a good six to nine months before they're even discovered. And too often they're discovered and we are notified by an external agency like the FBI. So the monitoring and detection is failing. Um, and of course we know now the attackers, there are no more script kiddies, there are no more people who want notoriety. Uh, it's all about uh, financial resources and those resources are your data, regardless of what kind of system you have. And you don't have to be a, a financial institution any longer. Everything's monetized. Um, and, you know, we have IoT, which isn't helping. Basically, it's turned back the clock about 10 years. You remember when Microsoft first came out with their servers and their tools? Everything failed open. Everything came out of the box open, and you had to put security in. We finally got through all that. Now things come secure, and you got to open up things. But guess what? IoT has turned back the clock. So it's a total mess, and it's getting worse because now it's consumer-based. Where in the past, it was the IT experts who kind of knew that and were working with that. And he gave a good talk about this earlier. <laughs> um, so you have to have an IoT strategy um, because it's on your network, whether you think it is or not. There are companies now that are selling tools to identify things on your network that you don't know are there. Um, and this doesn't even address the situations at home. 
Uh, so watch out for the killer toaster that's coming our way. Um, we all know this sad fact of the second bullet. For example, sequel, 12 years, the fix has been out, and everyone knows about it. It's still showing up in the OS Top 10. It's still showing up regularly. There's a failure in process. There's a failure in understanding at the top in the security chain or in the C-suite. Money is still not being allocated properly. Um, patching is huge. I'll talk more about patching. In my opinion, if if I had to spend money on one thing and one thing only, it would be patching. Right? We all want secure code. We want a lot of things. But the re reality is you get this triangle, and up at the top, there's just a little bit of money for security. But patching would have the most impact. But I'll talk about that. We need to have change management and configuration management. Printers and copiers are plugged into networks and aren't secured, so we've got backdoors with those all over the place. And uh, any kind of mission-critical data must be encrypted. There can be no discussion about that, and that's still not happening. And some companies are wondering, why, why are we losing data? Um, phishing, as I mentioned, is a problem. Our users are, are, are engaged uh, with, their, with their email. It's a personal thing. They get friends, family, and, and cohorts who send them something. And they, you know, we're human beings. Right? If you get something that says, uh, hey, this is a wonderful, gr wonderful joke. You got to click there. And you, you're, you're working your ass off during the day. So there's a temptation to click on that. I, I'd be a high percentage of folks here in this room probably have done that. I won't ask you to raise your hand. I won't raise mine either. Um, so we know about some of the insanity going on. I'm just citing a few examples. Uh, this could go on for the whole talk. I don't want to burden you with that. But, you know, the number of records, 100 million, you know, records for Capital One, uh, you know, our friends at Facebook who are so enamored with privacy, right, other than ours, 600 million users. Um, the collection, you know, the, the passwords that were dumped. I mean, look at these numbers, right? Huge. And even more. And these are, I'm just citing some of the larger ones that we were aware of recently. But as I said, this list can just keep on going. But, these are large, multi-billion dollar corporations in the States, and many of them worldwide, and they're getting hacked, right? So the question I'm, I'm asked quite a bit when I talk to small and medium businesses in the States is, what chance do we have if these guys are not doing it? They're supposed to have time, effort, budget, and security teams, but there are things that we can do. Um, how about the costs, right? If In these discussions with the boardroom folks, I talk about you know, what, what happened? We, IoT is actually adding costs now to the uh, costs of a breach. Um, and just for reference, again, this is American currency. Next talk, I'll convert it. But, you know, you get the point. As an example, a million record breach, which is not uncommon any longer, right? That would cost $40 million. And that does not include reputational costs or retention of customer costs. This is just pure dollars to fix the problem. Make a breach of 50 million, and those are becoming more common. If you remember some of the couple of slides ago, those are, almost all of those qualify. That's a $350 tab, $350 million tab. Uh, so there's definitely justification to finally get the attention of the decision makers at the top of the chain. One of the problems, I'm not sure how it is here, but throughout the states, the CISO, is not functioning as a, quote, CISO. Because what's that first letter? Chief? It's supposed to be up there with the C-suite. C. But they usually report to a CIO or a CTO or, or somewhere down the chain, and they don't get the audience with the decision makers enough. And now I'll talk a little bit about that too. But that's a major problem. Right? If you're not at the table, then how are you going to get the audience? How are you going to get the credibility? <laughs> because if you're assessing the CIO and his work do you think that the CIO is going to send everything up to the top, or you think they might filter it? You might have a wonderful relationship and have a great CIO, but from a strategic hierarchical structure, it's a recipe for failure, and it is failing. Oh, by the way, what's the average cost for a breach? $3.86 million. So those small, medium businesses are in definitely uh, trouble. So how about the, what's, what's the feeling about security among security professionals, the leaders. So these studies were done, and 70% of organizations say that their senior leadership has a comprehensive understanding of cybersecurity. 
or we take, are taking positive steps. Might sound good, but turn it around. That means 30% aren't. 30%. That's huge. We have a problem here. 70%, 77% of organizations are still operating with only limited cybersecurity and resilience. What chance do we have? We're all connected now, too, all our business partners, so we can't look in isolation, right? If we have one company here, you can't just go, well, that's their problem. It's our problem, okay? Um, 80%, 87% of organizations warn they don't have sufficient budget to provide. Well, yes, of course. I have never spoken to a CISA who's gotten all the budget that they felt they needed, not wanted, needed. And this is a EY Global Information uh, Survey, so these are not my numbers. So the breaches are increasing. The sophistication is finally starting to increase. Let me make a note about this. All the big breaches that we've heard about over the last five years, what's the PR spin coming from their communications head? This sophisticated attack got us. Sophisticated is used so much. None of the breaches that have been happening up until recently have been sophisticated. If you get a targeted attack, that's from a nation state. That's a different story, right? But all these attacks that have been going on, they're not sophisticated. This is just spin, right? But if things are getting more difficult for us, uh, well, so what can we do, right? And so here's why you came in here, I'm assuming. Um, some of this is management level, but this is very important. A lot of the skills for a security leader are soft skills, right? They aren't technical, right? So let me go through a bunch of these. Again, interrupt me if you have a question. So what I advocate is to make friends with and build relations with all the business units, all the heads, okay? Do security training and don't do it like I'm doing it. Don't PowerPoint them to death. Be creative, right? No, you guys are, we're all in the field, but for regular users, this won't work. They'll come in, they'll be asleep, they'll be on their phone, and they'll remember a damn thing you're saying. Maybe four slides they'll remember, right? Don't do that. Be creative. Think about, for example, gamifying your security awareness training. Pit division against division, okay? Whether we want to admit it or not, in our DNA as a species, we are competitive. Some people are a little competitive, some people are usually competitive, and they run to run for office, I guess. I don't know. Or maybe they're overcompensating. But the point is, we all kind of like to compete with each other. How many gamers in this room? Probably three quarters. Well, we only have one hand raised. That's interesting. Okay, so we're quietly competitive in here. So put people, pit them against, give the winners uh, uh, some kind of recognition. I worked in government, so we could buy them. We can get a plaque and a thank you. But corporations will buy gift cards to different stores or Amazon or other things, um, a wonderful parking spot that's rotated each month to the security star. You know, we smile about this stuff, but guess what? People want recognition. How many of you ever recognize for anything other than, hey, you didn't get this out in time? We like to be recognized. It's, it's human nature, right? It makes us feel good about ourselves. Make people feel good about security. Enlist everyone as an army of security folks. Now, they're not going to stop everything, but at least... They'll be thinking before they click that link, right? Again, we're not going to stop at all, but layered security is, is the way we win. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, yes, of course, very important. Many of you are probably working for companies that do this. Simulated phishing attacks, where the company itself fishes you, and if you click, okay, come get a little more training, right? You have to understand what your corporation is, is like, what the atmosphere is like. Right? So does a person open the email that's clearly a phishing attack? Do they then click on the link? That's bad enough. But then they start entering credentials in the link page. I've seen that all too often, and you probably will see it where you work as well. But the, you have to know this, right? The lockdown things. Um, okay, patch management. I mentioned it earlier, how important I believe it is. Um, where I worked, there's always, always this big push. They want to exclude certain systems because the... They're third-party managed, and they can't patch it because they haven't certified it or tested it with a certain patch level, and you might break it. Well, guess what? I'd rather break it than have someone who wears a black hood break it, right? So we have to be able to patch our systems. Uh, and there are going to be some exceptions. Uh, for example, med certain medical equipment. 
right? Those, those are very complex. There are, some of them are life-threatening situations that are, could occur. So in those cases, you, you do contro- extra controls, okay? Mitigating controls. You lock it on its own VLAN. You configure the firewall to only allow access from the certain systems within your network that need access. Lock down all services. I mean, you, the same stuff you would normally do, but even more severe because you can't lock down um, every application access for every user. It's just too difficult. Yes. Do, do, the, do they get... Uh, yes, typically what happens is with extreme pressure from security folks and the business leader championing it, you have need to get involved with the business side. Uh, they push the vendor to a level, but they're behind. They're still behind. Okay. Um, I mean, there are probably still some uh, XP systems out there for this medical equipment. XP. At least it's not 95, right? <laughs> Yeah, just a little bit. Um, third-party patches are, are very crucial. I've talked to people who say, well, we've got our Microsoft patching up and running. I said, what about Adobe? Although you don't have to worry too much about Adobe. It's rarely ever. <laughs> of course, it's patched all the time. It's, it's a mess. And so this has to be done. All third-party apps need to be addressed, too. And this is often, um, a, a, you know, f- forgiven. Uh, but before you roll out a patch, you want to test it in a test group, which is representative of all your major important applications. And who's that best use of the test group? Our own people, IT, right? Um, and a few business folks, too, because there's some business systems that they use that we don't. So we want to make sure before we throw it out there, because we don't want to do our own denial of service attack, do we? Um, a good strategy, which I don't see happening enough, um, when you first start in, in, a, in a role of, of senior management and security, you want to make friends with the decision makers. It's hard to figure out who they are because, as I mentioned earlier, you're positioned here and the decision makers are up here and there's often someone blocking your way. Um, you can go around, right? Maybe the culture in certain countries is prohibitive about that. You can't go around. You just have to go directly to your supervisor. But there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, can you want to get lunch? I'm new here in security. You know, we could talk about my vision and, and what's important to you. You're a stakeholder in the company. You know, what do you want to see out of a good security officer? Discussions. It's invaluable. Another thing about human nature, and I, you'll see this interspersed throughout my talk, is, is I'm an amateur psychologist, right? So I'm a little dangerous. But a lot of it's just based on my empirical experiences. If you buy someone lunch, so I didn't mention that, if you lunch with them, pick up the bill. It can get a little expensive, but it's a down payment on your future with the company. People will remember that. They'll say, oh, he bought me lunch. Let me see what he has to say, as opposed to, I don't know who the hell this guy is. Security. They, they, you know, they're a pain. So um, then just make sure you build relations with the key players, as I mentioned before, CTO, application development, right? We're all one big happy family, ideally. I was able to do that after a lot of work, but it, it changed everything. Um, the last bullet, talk business ease. It's not a real word, but the reality is you cannot talk to upper management like we talk to each other. The eyes will glaze over and they'll kick you out of the room. I don't care. Just talk about the things I care about, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, don't forget legal and risk compliance. My opinion is we should either be at the C-suite, sitting at the table, discussing things with the CEO, or we should be reporting to risk compliance, because that's what the C- uh, head of security is. It's all risk, right? My job is not to get technical. I have operations folks that, that, that do that. I figured firewall a long time ago. I really don't miss that. All right. Configuration management. How many of you have been in companies where... Your key person, the key system admin who builds systems was on vacation and the backup was busy. So you had someone else build a server and they go, did you put the latest image on that we tested? Did you patch it? Uh, where is that? Process breaks down and causes huge gaps in our security of company. So this needs to be regularly updated, maintained, okay, and deployed on every system including your admins who like to feel that they're exempt. Admins and, and the top-level uh, 
you know, sea pulp people love to be exempt from all kinds of rules and regulations. But guess what? They're the worst people to be exempt, okay? Because they're touching the most important information. Admins touch all our infrastructure stuff and can bring down the entire network, and the top-level folks touch our most valuable information, the gold that we try to protect. Harden every system, shut off all the system services that you don't need, right? Web servers consistently have too much things open. Um, make sure you, you establish and test a change management process. Don't make changes without building uh, a, a, a team of, of people who evaluate what the effect of those changes will be, right? And not all changes are equal, right? Empower the system admins to go ahead with changes just with a notification without approval if they're minor changes. But if it's going to affect mission-critical systems, they need the board approval because maybe there's something else going on at the same time that I know about. So it needs to be coordination. You must have a back-out plan. If it doesn't work, you got to quickly be able to back up because you can't bring down the, you know, a key system that either makes the company money or provides essential services. Um, policies and procedures. I'll just pass along my pet peeve about this. Still today, I don't know why, people are still writing policies and putting procedures in them. And they're 16 page policies. The point of a policy is you want people to read it. They're not going to read it if they got to wade through all the procedures. But you also want to be aware that to change a policy is a big pain in the butt. You got to get signatures going all the way up to the top administrative person in your company. You don't want to change your policy every three or four months when technology changes or the way you do things change. That's a separate standing dynamic document, your procedures, how you do it. Policy is what you're going to do. Procedure is how you're going to do it. Keep them separate. Otherwise, you're just asking for trouble. But, you know, the, this, the people at the top, they want to have minimal to things, min minimal time to spend with you. Oh, sign this. Okay, I did that two years ago, right? Okay, that's fine. But your procedure should be constantly kept up to date, and you need to review them on a regular basis. If you make a significant infrastructure change or something important about your whole organization, then review your policies, because there could be changes that you need to make on those as well. Um, please engage HR. Policies should be part of HR's oversight as well. They get the employees to read and sign your acceptable use policy, right? Legal wants to make sure that they've all seen it and signed it. So if they do something that's terribly stupid and wrong, they can't turn around and say, well, you didn't let me know that this was wrong. Um, and there have been, well, America's terrible with the legal system. Everyone's suing everybody for everything. Um, it's better here, for sure, that much I know. But there still will be people who will say, well, you know, you didn't inform me. Right? So that's important. Um, portable devices, BYOD. By now, you would think it's, there are plans and ways to address it, but it's still problematic. You're going to have a lot of people who only want one phone, which means that their phone now has to have access to the critical data in your systems. You have to figure out a way you want to do that, whether you sandbox it and have a, a special compartment on their phone, whether you manage their phone with your mobile device management tool, the users need to understand the impact that will have on them. And uh, in the States, there's something called e-discovery. Do you have anything like that here, too? Okay, so what happens in America, if there's, there's an investigation or, 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 or a legal action and someone has used their phone for business purposes, that phone can now be brought in as evidence and examined to look for emails or, or information regarding the case. So a user needs to be aware of this stuff. So I won't talk any more about that here. Um, this is of interest to everyone here, but you're very familiar with this. But it's still a problem in the States. It's probably a problem here. Not enough security is getting baked in early on from the very beginning. Okay? Key relationships. See, so head of application development. They got to be friends. They got to work together. Um, we need somehow to get good application developers to want to be security champions, to want to work with security and the other way around. I've seen situations where you have really intelligent security folks that don't code. They just, because that's the makeup of the workforce in that particular company. And you have these coders that would like to do security, but they never received the training in school because they learned in universities where 
security wasn't built in. They just learned how to efficiently code and get the stuff done and get it out. And they feel proud when they get creative sometimes, but they're still using tons of third-party libraries without even thinking about whether they're secure or different ways to do it. Are they parameterizing? So there needs to be a bridge in a lot of companies, right? So you need to get an application developer who wants to be into security, get him trained, get him working with security team. You don't want the security team to hand off to the application developers. Here's this 100-page report we got out of our dynamic scanner. Go fix That'll just blow the whole relationship. So the security team needs to be able to sort through all the false positives and sort through and say, hey, we, this isn't applicable where we are because we have other controls in place, right? Because every company is different. So there needs to be a, a joint effort in going forth and, and exploring all this stuff. Um, I'm preaching to the choir here, but when, when I talk to CISOs and CIOs, I have to explain the difference between penetration tests and vulnerability scanning. You guys get it. You have to do both in any application because if you just do the automated stuff, you're not going to catch anywhere near it. You need manual code reviews, pen testing. These also have to be built into the whole processes at your companies. Um, on the project side, there are lots of, of, of good-intentioned New applications that somebody spoke to appear in another company and they bring in and say, we're going to do this. At the very moment they bring that into the company, it's got to be logged with your project management team and security needs to be notified. What we did is we came up with a whole uh, qualification checklist. Tell us whatever you know about this app so far because you don't haven't even built the platform yet, right? But it's an intention, a proposed project. And I had built in security questions at the very beginning. Does this would be addressed by the uh, access from the internet? Is it just our company's employees? Is it the business partners? Is it the public? Each one of these comes with a different risk level. And you need to know that. And based on their responses, that's how you would propose building in security controls. So that has to be reviewed. If you have a PMO, uh, project management office, or some area, whatever you call it, uh, security's got to be speaking with them and building something like this in place. I think that uh, just about every one of my peers I've ever spoken to, at some point, it might be back five years ago, someone comes to them and said, here, this system's going live Monday and it's Thursday afternoon. I'm like, what, are you serious? I'm not letting anything go live unless I learn about it. And, you know, hopefully those days are gone, but I'm sure that in companies that you're still seeing these problems. Don't forget physical security. Uh, in the States, there's something called a CSO, a chief security officer, and typically physical security is under them as well, surveillance cameras, access cards to get into the buildings. Uh, but typically it's CISO and then head of security or physical security or, or head of facilities. And the problem, the head of physical security is normally not trained in anything related to information security. So for decades, the access cards could be easily skimmed if he, she pulls out her card, I can just walk by her this close with a skimmer that's easy to buy, and now I've captured that information. I go back to my office, run through, and make my own card. And now I just walk right in. I've seen it. So they need to be educated. I did some assessments where the security cameras were on the network but not secured. So I was able to download the images. So guess what? Another back door. There's back doors everywhere. But the facilities people never even thought about that. So don't forget that that's a, a big problem. And do you have processes in place? You see people walking out with servers? I mean, it's happened. Uh, you have to monitor. This one's really important. You've probably heard talks at this conference and, and other conferences. You're not going to stop someone who's determined to get into your system. You will not stop them. You can spend billion dollars. You will not. But if you monitor, and detect them immediately, you shut them out, block them, right? And so this is key. You also need to be able to react quickly if they're in, um, and architecturally, you want to segment your network to as many different logical ways as possible so they you minimize the loss if they happen to get through and start exfiltrating data. Um, you want to monitor unusual behavior. Sally has been a great worker, but she works a 40-hour work week, and maybe once every six months, she'll work from home on a Saturday for two, three hours to download, you know, a thousand records to work on or something. But this one Saturday, 
She's downloading 200,000 records and she's online for five hours. Do your system detect this? Do you have anomaly detection? Because this is what happens because the insider threat is very real. Um, and then you look for patterns as well. Are, do you, is your, where, your help desk system, which is not managed by security, but by your, your admin team, do they just continually fix every ticket blindly as quickly as possible, or do they stop and evaluate it at a higher level and say, wait a minute, do we have 50 people all have their accounts locked at the same moment, or does the same person keep having this thing over and over and over? Um, we, ha we had one person who ha kept continuously having problems logging into the system. And so I said, i got to find out what's going on. So I went over to him and I said, so what's the story? We, you know, we keep having to reset your password. We just reset it. What was your old password? He said, well, it's Mickey, Minnie, Donald, Daffy, Popeye, Bluto, Olive, Amsterdam. I said, excuse me? Why would you have a password? He said, I'm following your policy. I said, what policy? Eight characters and a capital. <laughs> okay. It's a security field. That's the best I can do. Have you ever, anyone else know of a security joke? Anyway, that's the kind of field we're in. Anyway, I just felt we needed that, right? We're, we're getting close to the end, but give me a break. Um, manage security services, okay? So we're under a lot of pressure to find, retain, and train people. It's getting worse, right? There's less and less available people, more and more need. The predictions for the future are dire. Okay, and so a lot of companies are now saying, I'm just going to pay a company in the cloud to, to take care of a variety of different aspects of my position. They're going to do incident response. We maybe we'll back to, back up to the cloud. Okay, uh, but a word of caution. I've spoken to peers and some of them say, I find, found out about this, this potential breach, this inf intrusion into my network before they did. Why am I paying them six figures? Other people said they saved my job, they saved our company. So the best advice, if you're thinking of that, because it's really a pain to continuously train people and lose them, or to even find them, if you're going to uh, explore that, talk to your peers and see what companies work for them, because they're really not all created equal, right? It's really wide variety of uh, success stories and failures. Um, reporting is really important. Uh, give you an example of something that we did. So we, you run your vulnerability scans on your network. It identifies anything that's plugged in. Then you compare it to your dashboard for McAfee, Symantec, uh, Kaspersky, whatever you have for your endpoint. And you compare that to your patching system, which will, I should identify every system on your network. And when you find systems in your vulnerability scan that are not in these others, what does that mean? The agents were never properly installed but you wouldn't know about it because it doesn't show up in those dashboards. So you immediately open up help desk tickets to get the agents deployed because you have no endpoint protection on some systems. And guaranteed, you will have these in your system because you're massively pushing out agents to thousands of systems all at once. And you don't always get the reports back of what a successfully patched. So we, we find exceptions. We found exceptions just about every time we ran this report. Opened up tickets and get those systems updated. Um, that's very important. When you're doing your scanning, you open up the tickets, fix them, get a good relationship with your admin team. But then you got to scan again to see if they've done their job. Because what will they always say? Yeah, we got it. We got it. We're good. Do they always do it? No. So you need a way, unless you have an automated system which will alert you, which there are some out there, okay? Um, access management, uh, there were a couple of talks on, at this conference about this. Huge problem, when people leave a company, this is the one that, that gets me a lot and I still see it, um, do you know every system that they have access to? You know, we're moving more and more towards a, a combined single source of truth, all right? One database that shows who has access to everything that grants access. If you have a good full-blown IAM system, it's expensive. It takes a lot of work to deploy. But a lot of companies say, well, I'm just integrated with AD. But what about the legacy systems? Oh, yeah, that's true, right? So they have their own database of user access. Somebody leaves and they forget to turn that off. They can just log in from home to a lot of these systems. So there needs to be a good process in place to be able to certify that people still need access and at the appropriate level. 
We came up with a manual system because you know, I was working in government and talking about being behind the eight ball, always behind. And what we did was we issued, uh, we, we printed out the access uh, database for e each system. A lot of systems, I know. And they, we indicated the level of access, whether they're admin or just user or work group leader, whatever you want to call it. And then we sent it to the business owner or the, or the system owner, and they had to go through the list and certify and sign at the bottom that all these people still needed access. If they came across people that had left, that we didn't know about, which happens, believe it or not, they had to open up a, a ticket, send it to the admin team, and they remove the user or change the access. And of course, this was not real time, right? It was like an audit, but we were hitting all the systems and so that's an example of ways that you can compensate for not having the budget for things you need to do. You gotta get creative. This was a hard project. I needed to send countless emails to get people to complete the forms. Phone calls, visits. Um, but it was important. Uh, I felt, now did I mention patch? Yes, I did. So just to level set, um, you guys were all too familiar, painfully familiar, I'm sure, with WannaCry, right? It's, and that never would have happened if they had just patched with the patch that was already out for many, many months. Never would have happened. Many of the breaches would not have happened if, if the people had just patched. So that's why I say this is crucial. A lot of the ransomware would not be happening. It's not always easy to patch. Some people have said to me that worked for huge companies, Fortune 500, there's no way we get everything. We just have too many servers. Well, that's your choice. There's, no, it really is. You decide. If you want to accept a certain risk level, then you can. But at least you need to understand the ramifications of your actions. Incident response, um, I talked a little bit about it earlier uh, as far as the monitoring. But you've got to have a team that understands what the issue is. The, the biggest uh, takeaway from this slide is please test your incident response system. Come up with a scenario, actually run through it, tell everyone, okay, we're doing the test, go. Everyone needs to be notified. Everyone, wait, hold on a minute. Yeah? Oh, we have that incident, you need me? You just run the plan, good. That's what you want to do. You don't want to have to stress, you want it to just go forward, and everybody knows their role. You drilled it, you rehearsed it, just not as quite as severe as a Navy SEAL, but you still got to rehearse it like it's a serious aspect because it could bring down a company, right? Make sure you have the right people. You still want business leaders and not just system admin guys and security. Sometimes it's application team, legal, finance, right? The people have to understand, let's say this was a breach. What would everybody do? Uh, encrypt. Uh, I'm sure everyone is like going, yeah, yeah. Encrypt everything. Stop with this trying to figure out where the important stuff is because what's important today, tomorrow something else might be and somebody might put something on a server that is critical PHI and then that system is not encrypted. So everything needs to be encrypted because this will um, prohibit a lot of breaches. You know, people walk out with, with PCs or laptops get stolen, which we know, you know, Airports around the world report thousands of laptops just left or stolen on a regular basis. You want yours to be encrypted so you can just go, well, we lost an asset. We lost $800. We can deal with that. But you really don't want to lose 100,000 records. Um, key management can undermine all your best efforts. Don't keep your keys on the same server where your data is. Make sure you have a good rotation plan for key management. That's a, like a, a little problem that we see that unfortunately is still there. You guys know about Telnet. You still see it. Yes. Don't use SSL anymore. We're up to TLS 1.2, I think. Or is it 3? 3. But 2 is still good, right? Um, disaster recovery. Again, test. Just like I said with the incident response, you must test your, your disaster recovery plan because too many times I've heard of stories where people say, yeah, we've been backing up regularly. Okay, can you restore it? Um, we're having trouble restoring. We don't know why. Did you test? Well, no, but... So, please, really very important. Again, a lot of the things I'm advocating take time and takes collaboration and takes a lot of units getting together, but, you know, that's where the, the role of a security officer as a salesperson, as a PR person, comes in handy. 
right? You must do this. And the plan, you've got to align with the business because it's not up to us as security professionals to make the decision of how long is it acceptable for a mission-critical app to be down. That's a business decision. They need to know, okay, we can get a hot, hot site, so we're up right away. Or we can get a hot, warm, hot, cold. We can be down for a certain amount of time. That's not our decision. We advise, right? So this needs to be discussed with business. How long can you be down? Do you have manual systems for business continuity that you can continue to work with while we still work in the background to get the systems restored somewhere else? All right, so, uh, oh, and back up to the cloud. Perhaps that's the next, I mean, that's happening more and more. There are companies that specialize in that, takes that off of your hands. Uh, but again, money, right, so that you have to weigh it. The fact that you're here shows you understand the value of networking and collaborating. Um, continue to, co to attend events. They're the best way for you to prepare for your, your career and to move on because you're going to make friends with someone here who's going to possibly help you dramatically in a situation that you have when you're not sure where to get the answers. I mean, I'm sure there's been some conversations among you here today with someone who had a problem similar to what you're dealing with and maybe gave you some advice, and there'll be more of that. So these are really good for that. I, I strongly advise you to do it. Um, uh, I'm biased because I'm on the Global OWASP board, so join OWASP. Come to OWASP meetings wherever you live. Look for local chapters that you can go to meetings. They're really great. You're going to find a lot of, uh, of people with good experiences that are going to be related to what you're doing or what you will be doing. Exchange cards. Make sure you get a handful of cards before you leave the conference. If you haven't, look next to you right now and, and ask somebody for a card. Trust me, these two guys are going to be good friends. Um, there is a, a lot of different groups, too, besides OWASP. I'm also with ISSA. In the States, I know they have, uh, in Europe, there's a lot of ISSA. So look into these things. They're all not-for-profit. I'm not selling you anything. I'm trying to help. Keep learning. These things are probably essential right now in your arsenal of how you do your work today, right? Continue doing this. Continue learning, right? One of the things I loved about that old Star Trek series and the movies was there's a future where there's no money. And one of the villains said, what do you mean, no money? then what do people live for? I said, to learn, self-improvement. That's us. Continue learning. Push yourself, right? Push yourself past your comfort zone. You'll never know what you're capable of, right? When the first time I spoke, my, my knees were shaking. I said, I got to learn to speak in front of people. And I'm comfortable up here now. Hopefully it comes across that way. <laughs> um, I, I find LinkedIn and Twitter is really helpful too. I get a lot of great links from people who, who say, this is a really good article. I just found out today that there's a draft for uh, NIST is coming out with privacy. That's, they're going to try to match it with the uh, um, this, the cybersecurity framework also. There's a new framework draft. So constantly good stuff there for you. Um, and please do this, right? I mentioned how we are, there's such a shortage of good people. The next generation needs us all, okay? They need us. Take a little time. Mentor someone help someone, hire students. I hired students. And look, it takes a little bit of time for me to train them. But if I find someone really brilliant in the interview, you can train them, believe me. And there's always stuff to give them to do, all the stuff you don't want to do. Just <laughs> hand them. They'll be happy because you got to start somewhere. you got to learn, right? So please help. There's cyber competitions, CTFs. Uh, help schools. God, schools need our help so badly with curriculums, Right? As I mentioned before, application development, they're not learning security, but anything related to our field, help out, go to your local school. Uh, I don't know how many of you have kids, but it'd be nice if, if they had a bright future to look forward to and this field was right. Look, we all have job security, right? We got this for the rest of our lives, because unfortunately things are just going to continue to, you know, be the arms race between, you know, black hat hackers and us. Um, but we all want the next generation to have our opportunities but be better prepared than we were. A lot of us came in, had to learn on the fly, had to learn on the job. I know I didn't really get good education in what I do. I bounced around. Um, perhaps you want to teach, you know, just one class here or there, or as a guest speaker. If you know anyone who's a professor, say, you know, I can give a talk on, on app dev or DevSecOps or security. Consider that, okay? Um, when, when I've seen people give reports to the upper management, 
and they say, we've had 15,000 attempts to hack our system today. Do you think that they care about that? Not at all. They like the red, yellow, and green chart that shows where we are. Real simple. You can laugh, but they're all about risk and money. Two things. When you think of upper management, risk and money. And cyber secure, uh, insurance, is that a thing here in Europe? It's huge in the States because of the cost that I mentioned earlier, right? Cyber insurance is something that companies are buying. Sometimes the cost of a breach is more than the cyber insurance of any one company will give you. You might have to get a secondary one. Um, but be aware that if you get cyber insurance, they will make you sign and certify that you have this whole set of security controls in place. And if the breach comes and they do an investigation, they find out, oh, we don't have a disaster recovery plan. Can anyone tell me what you think you will get in your payment? Zero. Right. So beware. It comes with its own caveats. Thank you all very much. Go OWASP. All right. <laughs> <laughs>